everybody. Uh, so I'm Ben from uh, Programmer Society, uh, which I'm assuming is where most of you have heard about tonight's event. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, Hypothesis is a partner of ours and we're really psyched to have some of them aboard uh, to talk about uh, how, you know, their work and how their job sort of has operated. Uh, and yeah, we're going to be asking a few questions. Uh, as Emma said, we're going, I will be facilitating sort of some questions to start off with. Uh, and then throughout that, you can ask anything that you feel is appropriate uh, into the chat and we'll deal with all those sort of Q and A's in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, yeah, so probably to start off with, what we'll do is we'll just give a brief overview of uh, who each of the panelists are and they can give a short introduction for themselves. Uh, so why don't we start off with Kelly. Hi everyone. Thanks Ben for having me on the panel and thanks Emma. Um, so I am originally from Brazil, um, completed my studies um, in Brazil. I have a college degree in graphic arts and a bachelor in social communication with a major in journalism. I moved to Canada when I was 22 um, and then started my career there. Um, it was a challenging start to a career, learning a new language and trying to get into the job market. Um, so I went back to school when I moved to Canada um, and did a second college degree in interaction design um, and have been working in the digital design space and digital product and team management for the last 18 years now. Um, that's me. Thank you. Uh, Tengus, would you mind giving a brief description? Yeah, sure. Um... So my background is I come from Mongolia, uh, so about now six years ago. Um, so working in a field maybe since 2008 uh, or nine. so. So started working on actual uh, kind of contract work um, and like, so like I kind of left the uni and uh, started working on contract work. So that's pretty much my background now here am I. Um, um, I don't have a degree, so that's something interesting to talk about maybe later. Um, yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Uh, so I'm British. I've lived here for about seven years. Um, my, my path into the industry was, uh, I guess, well, not particularly linear. I actually started out as a working as a foreign language, English as a foreign language teacher for about four years. Um, thought that was the way I was going to go. I enjoyed it, but then sort of my passion changed and I, I moved into the, the space initially in marketing for maybe 18 months or so. Um, but I've been working uh, essentially as a product manager um, for the best part of eight or nine years now, I think, something like that. Um, and I've been working with Hypothesis for just about two years now. Uh, as a consultant. Well, thank you, and uh, James. Oh, great, and yeah, thanks, Ben and Emma, for having me here. And so, yeah, I did a Bachelor of Science majoring in physics and minoring in computer science, and um, I was born in Australia, but I ended up doing a PhD in Switzerland, and on return, um, I started my career as a software developer, and so for the last 14 years, I've just been um, undertaking computer software jobs, uh, I did five and a half years for the Department of Defense in Australia, working on naval military contracts and counterterrorism. Um, from then on, I spent a number of two year segments across IT, um, mining sector, um, the, the health industry as well. And now I'm working uh, for Macquarie Bank, um, doing it um, for Hypothesis, which I started at, at the beginning of the year. Cool, thank you for all those introductions. Uh, we'll move on to some of the questions now. So uh, the first thing we want to say, start off with is obviously you all work in agile development and you work in very different areas of agile development. You know, uh, Hypothesis offers areas from, you know, software engineering, UX design, project management and agile coaching, which all of you sort of cover in a broad range. Uh, so when you put all of these together, what do you think is the most essential things to keep in mind and the most important attributes to agile development as a whole? Can anyone start? <laughs> anyone can start, yeah. Look, I think I might start there, Ben. I think for me, one of the most important 
things about agile is the continual improvement. And so it really doesn't matter what stage you're at, how old you are, how, how young you are, or no matter what level of maturity the organization has, as long as you start somewhere and as long as you're measuring to move forward mm -hmm. uh, and as long as you're actually moving forward, then I think um, you're, 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 being, you're being agile. Um, it's, it's great if you've got some ability to measure how far you're, how much you're improving. Um, but as, as, lo as long as you are improving somehow. Yeah, James stole my answer. That's exactly what I was going to say. Continuous improvement for me is the fundamental thing that underpins um, all, not just agile development, but um, any, uh, any sort of agile way of working should be underpinned by continuous improvement. I guess for me, there's two key uh, things for agile development. Um, and I'm maybe a bit biased because of my background. So the first one is around user centricity. I think it's great to make progress and move to a goal. But if you're getting to a goal that doesn't solve a problem for anyone, what's the point? So whose problem are you solving? And are you solving the right problem? Is the second piece. So experimentation, I think it's critical to agile development. Um, for experimentation to happen, you need to have a trusting environment. Um, and so that becomes a really key element of building a agile team. Um, a trusting environment will lead people to take risks, will open up room for uh, creativity um, and for rapid learning as well. So you can move through things really quickly. Um, as people <laughs> like to say, you know, fail fast. But the whole point is you have ideas, you try them, you don't get too caught up in um, putting too much effort before you, you do a small test and see if that solves the problem for anyone and then you keep going. Yeah, I, th I think all of that. And from my, my end, I think it mindset aspect in agile is also very important, uh, very important role um, it plays. And I guess like there's lots of like tools or practices uh, around the industry for ages but like as long as like people in a team or that software um people in the team doesn't have a mindset to actually change something or improve something it will not work um yeah so i would add mindset on top of it thanks that's great uh, so one of the aspects that you were bringing up is this idea of you know it's all about improvement through measurement and through sort of understanding things better uh, so Kelly brought up the idea of, you know, human centricity as a way to measure it. Are there any other specific ways you could measure are those successes? I mean, it depends what you're trying to measure, right? I think there's probably two, the, the, way, I, the way I approach it is there's two buckets. There's improvement of your product and therefore the customer experience, but there's also improvement within the team uh, as well. And I think you need to measure both and pay attention to both because if you have a, uh, very, very often, if you have a dysfunctional team um, that is, you know, highly disengaged and doesn't trust each other and, and, and all these other bad things, generally that will produce uh, a pretty poorly designed product and a very poor experience. So uh, you need to pay attention to both, uh, for me, both team uh, and your product slash uh, customer experience. That's great. Uh, does anybody have any other points to add in terms of that aspect? One thing that has been a key part of some successful agile teams that I've been part of is say if you're using a, a tool um, to organize all of your tasks like Jira, and then you can, if you have a good rhythm with your team about sizing and everyone is constantly sizing all of the tasks that everyone is doing, you can work out your delivery velocity. And, um, and this, this, this is a really good way to constantly measure how you're going with time. But then you might want to experiment with a new idea that you've got about one of your team members might have a new way of working, which may, which they think may, um, or they hypothesize, may think will, be, will result in a much faster delivery. And so the good thing about using automatic tools like, like Jira to, to measure your software delivery velocity is you can see that impact quantitatively over time. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of uh, software and tools in place that are used for that kind of delivery mechanism. Uh, all right, we might move on to the next question then, uh, which is, so 
uh, throughout your careers and throughout sort of, you know, your journey that you've taken to get into the industry, have there been any specific key challenges or successes that you've had? Uh, and were there any sort of main takeaways that you've had from those situations? For me, for me, when I read this question, I, I think I immediately jumped to, to the, some of the challenging parts. And more often than not, I think I, I can probably say, say all the time, in fact, any time there's been a challenge, it's been related to people. Um, I think we, we often get caught up in, you know, we work in the, the digital world and, you know, we're engineers or product managers or, or designers or whatever. But um, ultimately, it comes down to how people interact with each other. Um, that's how you get the job done. And so the most challenging thing that I've found is how to um, build, those, build those relationships with people in, in a meaningful way when you, you, know, you come from completely different backgrounds, you may have completely different philosophies um, for different things, but you, you need to work with them, you need to um, you know, forge that collaboration with them um, in order to achieve a, the right outcome. And that's, that's often a challenge when you're working with people um, who you know, may well be entrenched in some, some, uh, some super old uh, way of working or may not necessarily think about your benefits of, of collaborating with others. Um, so that's always a significant challenge um, with working with people that probably don't want to work with you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for context on that, a lot of Hypothesis' work is uh, about sort of agile transformation of existing businesses. So as consultants, people go in, and sort of explain the value of sort of, you know, the agile way of working and transform the workplace with those uh, setups. So, yeah. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll add my um, answer to this, um, which similarly to Tom, um, you know, I found that the challenging aspects of my career had a lot to do with people. Um, I guess the two most memorable ones for me um, well, first, uh, uh, a business closure that I had to be part of with uh, Virgin Mobile. Um, and it was tricky because there was no case study out there to how to do a successful business closure and how to move, I guess, people in a kind, ethical way through that. Um, we've been seeing a lot on the media now um, in the context of COVID around how different businesses are dealing with that situation. And more recently, um, just last week, you know, a lot of talk about how Airbnb has done um, sort of a massive layoff. Um, I think that is a very challenging situation to be on because we really need to balance people's um, uh, needs with what's ethical to do, with what's the right thing to do for the business. Um, and I think I grew a lot from that experience from a leadership point of view. Um, and the second one was uh, doing a massive transformation project with Optus, which was um, we were trying to move a business unit of around 450 people um, from one way of working, which was old waterfall method. Um, so a lot of separation between different departments working in silos to a fully agile delivery um, unit. And so using cross-functional teams, people had to take on new roles. Um, you know, they had to move away from the, the teams that they were used to work with. So there was a massive amount of change going through the business. And um, the key challenge there was how to keep people engaged, how to make them feel safe, how to upskill them uh, and give them the new skills that they require to do the job. Um, that they were being presented to um, and not lose any of the amazing talent that we had in the business. Right? So making them feel that we were investing in them and that we were growing together um, in that sense of safety was really important. So I think those were the, one of the two most memorable ones for me in terms of growth um, from a challenging perspective. And when I think about sort of the uh, when change has not been been sort of forced on me, but when I was seeking out change, you know, where I grew the most um, was when I seeked out responsibility. Um, so I seeked out to take on a new role or to do things that were really challenging and new to me. Um, and I didn't necessarily have all the skills, but um, 
I just asked for help. I had different mentors who helped me along the way. And those are amazing memories that I have, um, knowing that you put your hand up for help and there's always someone out there willing to help you. Yeah, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just add one piece to that as well. I think often the more challenging a situation you're in, the, the, generally the more rewarding it can be. Um, so I think being, have, being challenged and being rewarded uh, are quite often two sides of the same coin. Yeah, so I, I think I also want to talk about a little bit more, like I guess two, two things from my end. I, I mean, first, like as a software engineer, the most rewarding part, also most challenging part is you're trying to solve something uh, like a very hard problem. And you may spend quite a amount of time or quite a amount of effort to actually trying to get done or trying to understand what's going on. But end of the day, once you kind of uh, get through those hard parts and then uh, like you have work, work in software and at the end, that would be like the most rewarding part in, in like as a software engineer in, in my career. And also like, in, in, like working in the consulting industry now, almost like um, uh, three and a half years. And um, I've been like part of the, the whole kind of company organization transformation uh, part so that was like the company who um, like which work in very uh, kind of traditional way and we, we get come along and kind of started transforming that company from new ways of working um, and then like being a part of that journey also very challenging uh, as well as very rewarding and I guess like at that this stage uh, I started gaining like more kind of soft skills and I started understanding that as a software engineer, having a soft skills is, 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 the, is the like the most important thing as well, like current this um, uh, software engineering space. Uh, James? Well, I do agree with Tengus there. Um, it's not all about just coding, sitting in a computer and delivering value. It really is dependent on you know, um, interacting with people, um, showing how much you care, showing empathy, um, and really providing that overall package. Do you have any uh, particularly challenging moments or situations that you've been in in the past that you've solved in a like interesting way? Going to lunches with your colleagues is really important. Socializing with your work colleagues. I think that's, that's really, I think, the best way to get over any um, um, any challenges I think in the workplace, and especially if there's some sort of regular monthly meetings that you can have with your coworkers, I'd, I'd go out of your way to to attend those and really get to know your colleagues on a on a deep level um, that's not just professional. You know, you might find that you know you love dogs, you might find that you know you love sailing, and by um, by connecting with your colleagues in ways outside of work, it really does enrich the whole work experience with your colleagues as well. I would also add some things like, because in, in early in my career, uh, I guess as a software engineer, I had to like spend so much time for coding. I don't know, like maybe like it's, it's because like trying to understand the, the things in English, which is my second language, that is the hard part. And I started like kind of understanding that bit more and like I would say, I, I, I actually spend so much time for coding, right? So, so much time for doing something. And then I would definitely can say, uh, like those amounts of time definitely pay off in, in my, I mean, paid off in my career. Um, yeah, so hard work definitely pays off. That's great, thank you. Uh, if nobody has any other specific moments, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, so what we have been looking at this time is that if there have been any uh, major changes that you can sort of see on the horizon for your industry, uh, whether this is like the industry as a whole of your particular fields and, you know, UX design or engineering or project management, uh, if there are any big sort of shifts that you can see coming and sort of, you know, how you're expecting to deal with them. I, I looked at this question and I... Um... It made me smile and, uh, and then it made me reflect and uh, I've 
I'm reading a book at the moment called Anti-Fragile, which, which talks a lot about predictions and, uh, and stuff like that. And um, the, my, my, I think my response, and especially given the context that we're operating within uh, right now, is that uh, things are way too unpredictable uh, to, make, to make any uh, valuable um, prediction for what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, and I think all you can do is just sort of go with the flow and uh, adapt when, uh, when you're presented with changes, which clearly mm. have done. Kelly? I agree with Tom. I think adaptability is so key um, in this moment and has always been and will always be. Um, I think we've, we've talked about the book Sapiens before Tom and I um, it's, it's a brilliant book and I just read it a couple months ago and it really makes you realize that as humanity we've we're only here and we're only thriving because our ability to adapt so I'd say it's a core skill to develop um, you know resilience and adaptability um, maybe I looked at the question in a, a narrower way and and so I had like three things that I thought would po possibly be helpful to think about um, within the digital and experience industry uh, for the next year. Um, and so the first one being around uh, the digitization of tools. And so what I've seen happen is a lot of companies have been forced into digitizing. So they've had all of this sort of old processes that they were able to just, you know, keep tagging along and using it how they used to be. But right now, because everyone's working remote, they need to speed up things. So I was going through a specific onboarding process, for example, and they send me a PDF. They wanted me to print it, sign it, and scan and send it back. I'm like, oh gosh, like, <laughs> who know how to do that? You know, it's like, and very quickly, um, within a day of sort of me complaining, they were like, okay, so here's the process for signing digitally. And it's just a small example, but I think a lot of businesses right now are trying to um, get up to speed in terms of digitizing their tools. Um, the second one is uh, the opportunity for all of the new business models that may come up. It may be tools um, to keep us safe. So think of what the travel industry will look like six months from now and a year from now. I think it will be very hard for us to go back to what it was. And so what are the new... Uh, tools or pieces of technology that we will need to support uh, the public safety. And we're already seeing some of that with the uh, COVID app that's being rolled out, for example, um, in Australia and many other countries. Um, and, and with that comes a third piece, which is uh, behaviors, right? So building trust. People will only take on these new tools um, if they trust the brands, the company, or the government organization that's rolling them out. Um, and even in the workspace, because we're now re working remotely, trust becomes way more important. Um, so you can no longer be supervising people in um, old ways. And so, you know, micromanagement type of behavior is nearly impossible. And so trust really becomes a, um, a competitive advantage in a way, because if you have a trusting environment that creates safety, if people feel safe, they will start to take risks. And when they're taking risks, they're um, going into innovation. And so I think, you know, trust leads to innovation, which leads to new business models and tools. I think like the current situa situation we have uh, a lot, like on top of those uh, guys say, I mean, lots of businesses start adopting the remote working and especially, I, I guess, like, I mean, the tech industry is actually pioneer on this, right? So there is like a lot of uh, kind of startups starting in remotely, GitLab, uh, GitHub, uh, so you name it. And I guess, and on top of that, there are lots, and in actually like software, um, uh, software development spaces, I think the AI would, kind of uh, started coming really important role. And then some of the repetitive tasks, what we do may be replaced by um, new frameworks, um, new uh, kind of innovation to change those things to uh, AI-based solutions. And yeah, I, I, think, I think that will come 
to the industry and it's going to be interesting to actually part of it. Uh, James, do you have any points to add? Yeah, thanks, Ben. One thing that I've noticed is that if I, I look at the last 14 years that I've been a professional for, it's that it's now easier and quicker to do things than we did before. So 14 years ago, it must have, it, it, it took an incredibly long time to spin up a server. We couldn't even have cloud servers. There was no cloud. There were, Agile was only just brand new. And so um, it's funny that if I look forward to the next couple of years, one thing I can guarantee is that it's just going to become quicker, easier and cheaper to deliver value. I think that there will always be a need for engineers to produce products, no matter what it is, but they'll just be able to do so uh, in a quicker, cheaper manner. Okay. Uh, no, that's, that's good. So um, what I'm wondering is these are all like our predictions, but do we have any specific things that you would like, if, if, if you think that the future is very unaware, what would be some hopes, I guess, uh, some things that you really hope come in, you know, or become more prevalent? I, I actually have quite strong feelings that uh, the technology is, is permeating too many aspects of our lives. Um, and we're, actually, we're actually going to be poorer for it. Um, what, I, what I hope is that, uh, is that a, a line is drawn where the human experience doesn't suffer as a result of, of technology being introduced and relationships uh, don't suffer as a result of technology being introduced. Um, you look at you look at apps like uh, Tinder and all those all those other things. And thankfully, I I met my wife um, you know many years before before those dating apps and stuff like that were introduced. But um, I actually see them as a bit of a uh, a blight uh, on on the human experience. So my hope is that uh, is that there'll be uh, uh, somewhat of a rejection of some of these uh, digital experiences that uh, I think are actually. Uh, mean that we live poorer lives, not richer lives. Okay. All right. Uh, so the last one is uh, fairly broad, but it's basically just uh, any, any at all advice that you would give to somebody who is starting in the industry. So somebody who's at this panel here tonight or just in general, uh, you know, anything like based on the situation that we're currently living in right now uh, that you would sort of say. Um the risk of getting on a, on a soapbox again. <laughs> um, uh, this, this, this question I, uh, I, I quite enjoyed and I, I gave it some thought uh, today and I come up with uh, a couple of things that I would, I guess I would, would be advice. Um, the first is to work hard. I don't think there's any substitute for working hard um, and smart. I think you can balance that with both work hard and smart. You can, you can work very, very hard and, uh, and not get very, get anywhere. Um, so work hard and smart. Um, absorb, absorb everything you can. Um, read as you know, read a lot. Uh, absorb from others. Learn from others. Um, but also do something that you're actually passionate about. Uh, I think there's, um, if you, if you're pursuing something that you're not passionate about, um, you know, you'll end up ten years later just hating what you're doing uh, and hating the last ten years for the fact that you, it's taken you ten years to figure it out. Um, so do something that you're passionate about, follow your passion, um, and just, I think, acknowledge that everyone's different. Everybody has different timelines. You know, some people will go straight into, straight into work. Some people will, um, you know, will, will keep studying. Don't, I wouldn't compare yourself to others. Just walk your own path, um, I think, would be a, a key piece of uh, advice from me as well. Yeah, which I think is very relevant considering that uh, everybody here is from such different backgrounds. Uh, there's no one way, you know, it's not just go to uni, get a job, go, go forward. There's, you know, so many different ways you can go about it. And embrace, embrace that as well. You know, you're, you're, you'll be richer for having those different and varied experiences than if you just, you know, think that you need to get, if you're an engineer, if you need to think you need to get straight into engineering to be successful, it's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, I would add more things. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned before, like so, soft skills in, in the engineering field getting more and more important at this uh, point. And I would, I would uh, advise like, like really work on those soft skills and like hard skills, fine. You can, if you have a time, you, you can learn quite quickly and rapidly. There are 
lots of um, tutorials on, on online. You can actually just consume it and that that's one thing. And soft skills is important. And the second is like, so once you in, in, in the industry uh, on, on the field, there are lots of frameworks and tools which can create complex software quite rapidly, right? So, um, and, but like, in order to understand an actual business problem and tr tr learning to working as a team and like that, that's, that's most important part to, um, uh, in your career and, and like, that's, that's it. Yeah. All those soft skills, uh, are there any specific ones that you would recommend be like your, your primary focus? Yeah. Like I, I guess like, um, proactive uh be, being proactive and like being a team member and like trying to understand the uh the actual the problem you're solving rather than just doing what you kind of told to do um yeah so those ones are, are basic and then start like kind of having a mindset to actually uh like improve or having a like, i guess like What's it? Op um, an open mindset, a growth mindset. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So. Right, Kelly. Good, good. Um, agree with Tom and agree with uh, Tengiz. Um, and I think I would add. It's kind of scary sometimes when you're. At, looking from the outside and you're new to something. So looking at the job market before you actually get your first job or that first step into your career, but it's just like, you know, starting your first day of uni or starting in a new school, it feels sort of complex and scary at first, but once you get in there, you connect with your tribe, you get to know people, you develop some friends and you get involved in projects that you're interested in it all starts to sort of click and make sense. And so I would say to start taking those steps now, um, you know, you don't have like a, a physical location that you're going to walk in. It's not like this is my first day of uni, let me walk into the space and get introduced. The job market is just this really complex um, ecosystem out there. And so do a little bit of research and see who are people that inspire you or that are doing things that you think are interesting send them send them a message you know book a whole bunch of virtual catch-ups or coffees when we're back to you know the physical environment um and just have casual chats and get to know people and ask your questions um find two three four however many mentors um a mentor who may help you with your soft skills someone that may help you with your technical Skills or someone that you can just talk to and say, oh, this is happening. I don't know what to do. What do you think? Um, you know, and the other thing that I agree very strongly with Tom around just doing things that you love is that um, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in like um, trying to have all the skills before you can apply for a job or before you can put yourself out there. So especially looking at the job descriptions that get posted out, it seems like impossible to be ready for any of those roles. Um, but a job description is not a starting point, it's an end point in the way that I see it. Um, once you fully develop into that role, you may get to that description, um, but you don't need to tick all the boxes to apply to that. And so I had this um, situation the other day with someone who I have a mentoring relationship and this person is a UX designer and was saying to me, oh, look, I think I need to learn how to code because all the job descriptions are saying HTML is a plus or coding is a plus, etc." But it was just so hard for this person to do all of this coding tutorials because it's not her thing, you know? So don't do something just because you're ticking a box. Do it because you love it makes your heart beat a bit faster. You're like, you're passionate about that. So follow your heart. That's really good advice. It looks like James is trying to say something, but we can't hear him. <laughs> there we go. So, some good advice there, Kelly. Thanks for that, everyone. Yeah, and, and if I could just um, expand on the, on the mentor part, sure, you can reach out to anybody uh, who you like and just ask to be their mentor. 
but go in with a little bit of a plan, you know, just say you're just looking for one coffee a, a month or every two weeks or one coffee every six weeks or two months and just have someone just to talk you through uh, the profession. I think that's probably all I've got to add. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the benefit of uh, mentorship and the benefit of reaching out and sort of sharing those experiences with other people. Um, okay. Yeah, just, I just, just one thing I'll add on, on that piece as well is it's probably, it's broader than mentorship, but never be afraid to ask a question um, because if you don't know the answer, you, you know, you, it's likely that several people won't know the answer. So never, don't, I, I said, just don't have that fear uh, around asking questions, even if you think it's dumb. Um, you know, just don't be, don't be afraid to ask, ask questions, to reach out to people saying, hey, you know, can you be my mentor or can I have a coffee with you or whatever? Um, you know, the, the worst thing they can do is say no. And then you've, you haven't lost anything. So, um, yeah, just be bold and, uh, and reach out to people and ask them questions and make a good choice on company and culture, actually encourage and empower those kind of uh, uh, questions and, you know, uh, seeking help or all of those things. That's also important too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like I know for my personal experience that, you know, the way I've gotten jobs in the past is by not showing I have all the skills, it's by showing, you know, passion in the thing and I think that's like a big thing that I've seen a lot at Hypothesis is you know passion is always the big focus. Uh, all right I think we'll move on to uh, some of the student questions now. So we've got one in here and uh, everybody feel free to add whatever questions you want uh, over and uh, uh, so Val asks uh, how hard is it to change roles to work with a different tech stack or work with you know a different experience sort of uh, do you need to like restart or when, when you're changing from one sort of area of expertise to another, how do you go about that change? I guess is a way to phrase it. Um, so I guess like it's tech stack and probably more focused on software development. Um, I think like for, I mean, so once you in, 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 in the industry and then, you started working on, on, on these all the frameworks and all, all the tech stack out there. Um, I think it's, for, I guess like it's getting easier because those are co like core concepts of uh, like majority of them is always similar. And once you have, have a good foundation of one of them, and I think it's easy to actually kind of, uh, I, I would say, it, like it's maybe it's different for uh, many peoples, but I guess I find particularly it's helpful to actually get deep into what one of them and then started moving into different. So especially in con consulting, uh, like the industry, it requires to be a more agnostic in tech stack and we we change pro uh, projects and, and each project has different tech stack and we need to adopt that quickly. And yeah, I think it's it's getting easier over time, but I don't think it's, it's going to be uh, easy in its start. So once you have a certain experience in the field, I think it's, it starts becoming more easier because it's like a, the core concept of frameworks or, or tech stacks is uh, similar, but just written in different language or it's, it's small, small differences between those two. So you just need to understand those two and navigate the way through it. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Tengus there. And if I could just add something as well, once you get really good at something, people will ask you to work on other projects as well. And you might find that something will be slightly different, but then that'll widen your skill set, and then you'll get good again as well, and then you'll widen it further. So yeah, I just focus on doing that one, that one thing well at the beginning. I'll add a comment here as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I've, I've worked with, with many, many engineers, and um, the ones that I've worked, the, the best ones that I've worked with place a, a strong emphasis on self-development and keeping up with uh, different, you know, emergent languages and those sorts of things. So um, I think there's a, a massive uh, benefit to staying on top of these things and, and, and investing time, your own time in, uh, in your own development uh, around that. Yeah. Well, one thing I actually now do is I still do kind of after hours, coding and working on my personal project and something interesting to just learn and sharpening my skills. 
um, because often I find myself like in in a work I, I don't uh, I don't have a chance to actually work the exciting things I want to work you know so because it's it's like a different things right so I, I, like certain tech stack I've had to do something but there's a, something interesting appears like as Tom Tom said uh, I want to I want to keep up to date that one so I, I just want to start something personally and uh, if that's like something paid that would be good and otherwise i'm just uh, go along with it so start learning it. that's still i'm do do that yeah okay yeah i agree with um Tingles, james and tom and i think i would add it really doesn't matter if it's the engineering or technology space or any other area of expertise like thinking about this concept of this is what I'm loving today, um, but what do I want to learn about that I keep developing, right? And then sort of slicing your time in a way that you carve out time for learning and getting ready for your next sort of thing while you're getting really experienced in that thing that you're doing right now. There's this concept that um, we talk about a hypothesis quite a bit, which is of a T-shaped individual, T as in Perry. Um, so you have your deep area of expertise, and then you have your broadening area of expertise. Um, so for me, for example, I've worked um, in digital and design for a long time, and then I took on other roles around um, agility. So I've been an agile coach, um, and I've helped coach both teams and product owners, and that was really new to me. And say so, um, I was in very experienced in my career, but I was a apprentice as an agile coach. And it was an amazing experience to have to be actually learning something completely new. That doesn't mean I'm starting my career from scratch again, or I'm, you know, throwing away everything that I know, I'm just adding to it. So it's like pieces of the puzzle that you're bringing in and adding to what you know. Yeah, and I think you, we all, a lot of us kicked off with, um, by recommending, you know, or calling out continuous improvement as a, as a, you know, a fundamental principle of, of agile development, but you, know, you should you should apply continuous improvement to your to your own um, self development as well. You know, think look look for opportunities to improve and uh, and improve yourself uh, first. You know, then of course your team and your and your product, but it starts with you. Um, yeah. I actually had a question. This is going a bit rogue because I'm not like I'm not a student. Um, but I was in a job truth the other day and someone was like, is public relations really all glamorous parties and, you know, going to cool events and doing that kind of thing? Um, and she said, it's definitely not like that. So I was wondering if there were any... Well, for engineering is though, it's all parties. <laughs> Could be. Um, but like on that, I was wondering if there were any misperceptions about your industry um, that you kind of want to set straight. Um, yeah, as someone who doesn't really know much about it, um, yeah, I just wanted all of your insights on that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people view you know, the, the career of either working in product development or software development or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people think, oh, you know, or they have a view of Google with you know, the, 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 the bouncy balls in the office and ping pong tables and stuff like that. Um, and that's not to say that they're not there. They're, you know, in some offices they are. Um, but it's, it's just like any role or any job that you you want to succeed in um, it's 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 hard work <laughs> and, uh, so it's 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 not always going to be just hanging out playing ping pong like sometimes there'll be late nights sometimes there'll be stress sometimes there'll be tension um, but you know it, it, it's hard work and it but it, pay, it it pays off if you if you are passionate about it and you enjoy working in, in, in that environment um, but yeah certainly not certainly not all, all glamorous and uh, playing foosball and stuff like that Snap. I know some people that work in PR and they are very, very hardworking. So, yes, I'm glad that myth, that myth was dispelled from the previous. Uh, oh, very much so. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else like have any misperceptions about it, I guess? Or oh, sorry, I mean, not have misperceptions, want to bust some misperceptions. I, well, I haven't worked the company who, I mean, company which has that like, infinite um, kind of leave. But they are in the industry, they do have some infinite kind of uh, leave. 
um, like very, this look, sounds very trendy, but like some of my friends actually works in those companies and they said they never actually taken a leave more than uh, seven days. So, um, so that's, that's true, right? So you, you have a project in, in, in real life and I, I guess like, like it's, it's just a work, uh, end of the day. Um, I, I definitely think it's, it's been touched on, but I definitely think one of a misconception that a lot of uh, like undergraduate students have, especially in the engineering space, is that uh, their work is very technical and that, you know, it's all about learning sort of a, like you, you learn a specific skill set and then you say, cool, I'm a database engineer. Uh, and I think that's a way that sort of, you know, university majors are constructed, you know, you're constructed to have a very, uh, you know, definitive sort of skill set. Uh, and there's, that's definitely a misconception how that's busted is sort of, you know, in different areas, but I would, I would definitely point that as one. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. And there's a lot of emphasis played, uh, placed and Kelly touched on it earlier on the cross-functional team. Um, and to me, what that means is it's not just engineers, designers, product managers, each in their silo. It's you're, you're a team and you're responsible for the product that you're developing. Um, and if you only ever had a designer doing design and then passing it, out, passing it off to the engineers to, to build it, um, you'd, you'd, you'd have a pretty shit product. Um, so engineers, they get involved or they should be getting involved right from early stages, interviewing customers. They should be helping with design. They should be contributing feedback to design um, all the way through to, you know, to QA and, and measuring uh, the, the outcomes that they've delivered. So um, the, the age of the the one dimensional engineer that's just, you know, in a basement uh, tapping away uh, is, is, it's, yeah, it's, it's not really a thing anymore. It was, it's not anymore for me at least. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have a few minutes left. So, oh, there we go. We've got one more question. Uh, so how would you go about finding an internship early in your degree with a limited skill set? So uh, at least for us as engineers sort of, you know, uh, in our thing, usually, you know, the university wants us to try and find an internship, you know, when you're only like been studying for two years or so. Uh, and when you're really early on, what would you recommend in terms of where to look and how to search and things like that? Um, there are a lot of programs out there um, of companies now partnering with universities um, to bring in graduates um, and a lot of the times these graduates are invited in um, for shorter periods of time before they complete their degrees um, and it may be that you're actually just establishing that relationship early on so working with Optus um, we had two programs that were going on one was in with graduate students that were coming in to do a two-year program off the back of graduating and one was with students still in, in university and we had a mentoring program. Um, so we would partner and have a six months mentoring program. Um, that led to some interesting opportunities because obviously you're developing relationships and those relationships lead to opportunities. So I would say it starts by developing relationships. Yeah, I agree. I think there's also, there's also a case to be made, and I, th I expect the, the number of graduates or undergraduates seeking internships, I expect the market is quite saturated um, or certainly quite um, uh, competitive. Uh, so seeking out ways in which you can differentiate um, is, is, is probably a, a piece of advice I can give. It may well be maintaining your own uh, GitHub profile and maybe we're contributing to, to other people's GitHub projects. Um, the attendance of meetups, I mean, obviously the, the landscape we're in at the moment is, is, is quite different, but if there's, there's many, many meetups that take place, you get free pizza and a, and a few beers. Um, our workshops. Looking for a cheap meal, <laughs> then, then meetups are quite a good opportunity to do, you know, to do that type of networking and, and cultivating those relationships. Um, but yeah, I mean, but if you're, if you're, if you're applying for something and you, and you don't feel like you're differentiating in some way, you know, it, it may be tricky, but, um, you know, you have that time to, uh, to seek a, a, you know, some sort of niche passion um, and, it, dem and demonstrate that passion to, um, to any places that you're, you're seeking an internship of. Um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's a crowded marketplace. Yeah. 
Can I, can I just add as well, um, there is one other avenue which is open to you all, which is volunteering. And so there are often very many good causes out there that are looking for software developers um, on a voluntary basis. So this is a really good way to expand your network, learn a new skill and um, pick up a hobby and, and, and propel your, your career forward. Yeah, and you also, you never know who you're going to meet in those things as well. Like I've crossed paths, I've been in Sydney now for seven years uh, and I've, I think I've worked in maybe four, four places, something like that. And, you know, you, you, the amount of people that you, you, you know, your paths cross and you end up even bumping into them in, in the street um, and, and end up having a conversation. So um, you know, the, the, the larger you can build that network, be it through volunteering, be it through meetups, those sorts of things. Um, the, the greater your chances of, um, of finding that internship or, or finding that first job. It's a, it's a people business at the end of the day. Yeah, I think uh, I, I also want to add something as well. I guess if you, I, I think it's definitely worth it if you, if you actually get internship and then if, once you get it, I think you, you have to like kind of have a clear purpose to actually get something out from that that engagement right so three or how many uh, months you engage engaging at that internship and then i guess like i also want to suggest alternative uh, to to actually gain our actual industry experience in this field i guess so one of the thing i'm suggesting is open source so open source the like contributing open source project is awesome and it actually um like if you can start working on the the issues on those popular frameworks the people get to you at, at early stage and you might find actually a uh, good that kind of career opportunities from it i know that now some people actually full-time on uh, actually like a paid full-time on open source projects and just just what they do is they work on open source full-time and get them paid and like but the time in itself is like very flexible. It's awesome opportunity there. I mean, yeah, so I would definitely look into that field and start at, I mean, try contributing, right? So it doesn't necessarily be perfect the first time because you don't have much experience, but I actually quite like kind of admire this open source community because they are very kind of, kind of um, right-minded people to actually trying to help each other. And even you have something uh, kind of uh, like done there and you create pull requests, people come in and start telling you and then often they teach you how to write good code. And then you have like a, like if you, if you have like maybe involved open source quite long and by the time you graduate your uni, you might have really good experience in, in the field and you, you may be ready for the workforce, you know. So that would, that, that's something, uh, another opportunity I would definitely suggest and definitely look into it. It's a great call out. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, I think from like all those points of all the different avenues other than just an internship, a really good thing to keep in mind is that university isn't just about ticking all the boxes to get your degree. Uh, so many, you know, there are so many other things you can and should be doing in, your, in the meantime, really like show that that passion uh, and show that, you know, you're, you're progressing forward, not just because, oh, I need an internship to pass, but actually because, you know, that's the thing you want to be doing. Okay, so we have just about hit our final time. So I don't know if there are any last minute questions. It doesn't seem to be, that's, that's all good. Uh, thank you so much to uh, all of our panelists for coming. And thank you to uh, Emma for, you know, putting this all on and putting it all together. Uh, I hope everybody got a lot out of this. We'll definitely be putting up uh, a video version of this uh, online some point in the future. Uh, I would just throw out a quick, uh, a quick plug for our follow-up, well, the follow-on workshop after this. Uh, we'll be doing a intro to programming 2.0. So we ran an intro to programming, which was a very beginner level thing earlier this year. Uh, and now we're running sort of a, a follow on in a week's time, which is going to be more of their like learning the ins and outs of like some of the more interesting stuff that you wouldn't otherwise learn about. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in programming at all to be this, you know, um, we'll catch people up. Uh, but if you have some free time, yeah, definitely check out our Facebook page and see if you can make it to that. Uh, other than that, I will pass it on to Emma for some closing statements, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks, Ben, and thank you for facilitating that. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the speakers for taking time out of their, what day are we on? I'm losing track of all the days being in quarantine. Whatever day it is today, thank you so much for taking time out of it to be here and offer some insights to students. Um, I really hope that you as students got something out of it as well. Thank you, everyone, and see you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Oh, thank you. Thanks,